Welcome everybody. The very first YouTube channel and uh, also audio podcast on Anchor is where it will also show up. YouTube channel um, uh, interview in a series. It's uh, the, the series is called, you may have noticed, uh, Stephen Gray Vision. Stephen Gray, all one word, S-T-E-P-H-E-N and then capital G-R-A-Y, Vision. And the purpose of these is to explore the possibilities of an awakening humanity. I guess that's the simplest way of putting it. And uh, you will be able to subscribe to these. I hope to be able to put a subscribe button up here somewhere at some point uh, and some contact information both at the beginning and the end. So, as I say, I'm very excited because this is the very first one of these in a series that I hope to continue for quite a while. Uh, Chris Bache is our first, my first guest. And uh, we both acknowledged just before putting on the recording that we're both feeling honored about this. And so that's really exciting in itself. And so uh, before I actually uh, ask Chris to say anything, I'm going to uh, read a short bio and add a couple of little comments of my own. So um, Christopher M. Beige, officially, is, a, is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Youngstown State University, where he taught for 33 years. He is also adjunct faculty at the California Institute of Integral Studies and a fellow at the Institute of Noetic Scientists, Sciences. An award-winning teacher, Chris's work explores the philosophical implications of non-ordinary states of consciousness, especially psychedelic states. Um, Chris has written three books, Lifestyle, Life Cycles, I won't describe them here, um, they're findable of course, Dark Night, Early Dawn, which I read about 20 years ago, wonderful book, The Living Classroom, which I have not read, um, and his more recent, or well quite recent, about a year ago maybe, um, uh, or was it less? I can't remember. <laughs> um, yeah, six months. Yeah, anyway, uh, uh, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, subtitled Diamonds from Heaven. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to be asking Chris about uh, to give a summary of the 20-year uh, journey that he went on that's described in LSD and the Mind of the Universe, but I don't want it to take the whole interview, um, and in particular because, well, among other reasons, because it's um, uh, he talks he does do a thorough uh, kind of linear job of going through all that in two or three of these YouTube videos and so I would suggest if you really want to get into the details short of reading the book which is a stunner it's just amazing um, I would suggest uh, going on YouTube and looking up um, diamonds from heaven time waiver summer world 2018 um, and there's a like a 50 minute uh, talk that they recorded of Chris uh, uh, going through the, the whole journey. Um, and that book, by the way, I have it right here, so I'm going to show it to you, um, called LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Diamonds from Heaven. Chris, don't let me forget at the end to ask you uh, uh, it, it, for uh, any kind of contact information or links that you would like people to follow up on. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So anyway, uh, um, welcome Chris, to my inaugural um, Stephen Gray Vision YouTube channel series. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Stephen, and honored to be um, uh, in your memorial voyage. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of things I want to ask you about and discuss with you. And the um, I think a good place to start, however, it would be if you could give a relatively short again because people can go and look at the video yeah. uh, videos on YouTube uh, if you could give maybe I don't know five minute or something I don't know exactly <laughs> um, uh, sort of summary of you know well in the in the talks you talk a little bit about you know what got you into it you know maybe just a real brief reference to you know why you did this in the first place mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. um, and then a little bit about the 20-year journey and perhaps what you know where where it went after that something like that so basically what you're asking for is a is a highlight reel or a trailer for the book exactly which, yeah. Yeah. yeah well <clears throat> I'm a philosopher of religion. I was trained in philosophy of religion, and I came to this work with an interest 
in the potential of psychedelics to explore the deeper reaches of consciousness and by pushing through our personal, un our personal unconscious, entering into the consciousness, what I eventually came to understand is the mind of the universe itself. So I did 20 years, uh, 73 high dose LSD sessions, and I'd emphasize the significance of that particular protocol, high dose sessions working at 500 to 600 micrograms, because this opened up territory and experiences that were much deeper than when you're working with the types of psychedelics and the levels of doses of psychedelics which are being used in the therapeutic community today, which is so important and very important development there. This was different. This is a much more aggressive shattering of uh, the different levels of consciousness uh, and the boundaries of consciousness. I worked for four years, stopped for six years, and then worked for 10 years. I did an average of about five sessions a year. Uh, and where I went is a long story, but the highlight reel is I spent about two years basically working at what Stan Groff calls the perinatal level of consciousness, processing a lot of material around very early experiences, birth experiences, uh, death experiences, fear of death experiences, existential crises kind of work. Went through a deep ego death that just exploded my identity and catapulted me into early level spiritual experiences, spiritual reality. Then I spent another two years going through uh, a, a much more intense purification process that I called the, the dark night of the soul, where the work clearly pivoted. It took me a long time to recognize it, but it clearly pivoted away from my personal transformation or my personal healing and entered into the collective psyche where the focus was the healing or transformation of the species mind itself where i was processing experiences coming from thousands and hundreds of thousands of persons and thousands of years of time when that culminated i was spun into archetypal reality experienced various permutations of archetypal reality and vast territories in the collective unconscious, and basically was learning how to exp how our species lives as a single integrated entity, as a single being, all of us being fractal embodiments of that being. When that culminated, I went through yet another round of death and rebirth into causal level reality, where basically instead of the world being composed of parts, even the very big parts of archetypal reality. Here, the universe basically pulsed as a single entity, as a single life form, dissolving all boundaries, all membranes, even the membrane between matter and spirit. I explored or was given many gifts in that territory for about a year in a chapter that I call the benediction of blessings. And then for the last five years of my work, uh, I entered into a domain of, that I came to call the diamond luminosity, uh, entering into a state of consciousness that was pure light. And the most difficult thing to describe is the hyper, hyper clarity, just clarity beyond measure of this form of light. I discovered that there were many levels of light and the diamond luminosity was the, the purest, highest level I reached in my work. What Buddhism calls Dharmakaya are the absolute reality, the clear light of absolute reality. For those five years, I entered this reality only four times in 26 sessions with a lot of purification, a lot of, a lot of healing work done in those intermediate sessions. And then I was given one final vision of, um, of the human trajectory where we are in history, which had been a consistent theme in the work. And then basically the universe kicked me out. It gave me two sessions, or wrapped up our work without me really understanding yet at the time that it was wrapping it up. But it wrapped me up, wrapped up our work, and then ushered me on my way, and I stopped my work. So I stopped the work. I began it in 1979 and I finished it in 1999. And after I finished it, Spirit said to me in my meditation, 20 years in, 20 years out, mm. meaning that it would take me 20 years 
in order to understand and digest the 20 years of experiences that I had had. And then it just so happened, not by any intent, but it just so happened that uh, LSD in the Mind of the Universe was published 20 years after my last session. Hmm. Wonderful. Yes, and uh, you know, for people watching and listening to this, I want to say that uh, you know, if you didn't quite gather how stunning this journey or series of journeys really has been, uh, read the book because uh, it's mind blowing. It's truly paradigm shattering material. Um, I like to uh, occasionally joke uh, with no particular offense to uh, Terence McKenna, who did a lot of lovely work that um, the descriptions that he gives of where he went were just kind of tapping into uh, the realms where you have explored, where you've gone into the, you know, in, in these in these journeys. Um, so uh, a practical question though, uh, or uh, sort of, yeah, user-friendly question, so to speak. You have spoken in different ways about, well, several things related to this. One is you said you wouldn't do it the same way again because it was so intense. Um, and then you, you also understood that it wasn't about getting anywhere particularly. That's one aspect of this question I'm about to pose. The other one is um, clearly this is not for everybody. Um, and so there's something in there. And, and then just on a practical level for people who do feel like they are those sort of deep exploring psychonauts and want to do something like this, feel that kind of a call like you have. Um, could you just briefly describe the protocol, the safety protocol that you employed? Well, let's start with the safety protocol. Yeah. Uh, I basically <clears throat> uh, used the protocol uh, established by Stanislav Grof in the early years of his work and published in his book, LSD Psychotherapy in 1980. Uh, he distinguishes clearly low dose psycholytic sessions and high dose psychedelic sessions. In the early years, those psychedelic sessions were limited to three. I basically took that protocol, which always, and then, and then multiplied the number of sessions to 73. But I was always working in isolation. I was working in the privacy of my home or my wife's clinical office. I was always lying down, uh, protected from the outside world, no interruptions. I had a sitter. My sitter for all this work was Carol, my first wife, a clinical psychologist, listening to a very carefully curated playlist of music to support the deepening and the unfolding of the work. So basically, the sessions were completely internally focused, sheltered from the outside world. There was no interface with the outside world except through the music. And the focus was on encountering as deeply as possible what was arising from within my own consciousness. Now, the reason I... Mm -hmm. Chris, before we go any further, uh, yeah. a quick question uh, regarding the sitter. Uh, for anyone who's going to do this kind of work on their own, uh, yeah. what would you say the job description prerequisites are for the sitter? Like, do they, does that person need to have been to some of these inner realms themselves to be able to do that job? Or what would you say, you know, who, who, who could do that job properly? Ideally, a person who's doing the sitting should be experienced in these domains. Um, it de partly depends upon how interactive the work is, but the more experienced the sitter is, the more comfortable he or she is likely to be when the subject gets into this territory. Mm -hmm. In our case, uh, Carol was not really interested in exploring these domains herself. She read the literature with me, and that's not perhaps an ideal circumstance, but it, it works sufficiently well for us. Mm -hmm. The responsibility of the sitter is to take care of the, the subject so that um, they don't um, hurt themselves because some of the spasms that come up in this session are pretty violent. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of throwing up when you're working mm -hmm. with high doses and that wow. has to be taken care of. Um, basically making sure the subject stays focused so that there's, there's no acting out. Uh, any attempt to sort of step away and step outside of the session uh, needs to be discouraged and keep the person focused. 
material mm -hmm. uh, and then managing the music, staying in touch with the subject mm -hmm. so that they know they can anticipate where the subject is, sometimes asking questions, but mm -hmm. usually not often, so that they can shift the music when the person has gone into a shift in their own inner experience. Can you say a little bit about the music? How important it is, is it to get the right kind of music? I, I think in your talk, uh, the one that I mentioned on YouTube, you said something about a, you know, kind of a developing uh, quality to the music as it, it, it changed over the course of the of the session, of the yeah. whatever it was, six, eight hours or so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I basically uh, followed Helen Bonney's recommendations that Stan had cited in his early work, and she differentiates five stages of an LSD session. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's basically an ascending, there's an early latency, and then an, when the, the drug begins to kick in, there's a high activation. And again, this is working with high levels of LSD where the activation level is particularly intense, and there's a huge uh, surge in the quantity of energy that one is processing. And that continues to build, and you want music that can uh, encourage the surrendering, encouraging the giving in to uh, whatever is happening and, the, and supports the breakthrough uh, of your own defenses. And then the, the experiences will build until you reach a level where eventually, if you manage them well, uh, courageously, you go through some form of crisis, some crisis in the experience, some death and rebirth experience, where then you're catapulted for the remainder of the session into the ecstatic portion of the journey. My experiences were always the early portion of the session was a purification um, experience culminating and then ending in a, an ecstatic portion of the experience. Then there's a long peak of the experience where once you've made that breakthrough, you want music that supports the long, expansing, expansive worldview and then a very, very slow decline, a re-entry with gentle music that gives you a spacious background that allows you to process your experiences. And as you come back to your ordinary consciousness, integrate your experiences with your uh, conventional, your identity, your ordinary identity. Mm -hmm. I found that after a, a number of sessions that uh, when I began to use indigenous music chanting, uh, with my sessions, I found that to be much more powerful, much more evocative mm. than classical music, oh, even no, powerful no. classical music. Yeah. So I, I, I had a preference for that. And uh, so I collected a lot of indigenous music over the years from different cultures. And you don't want music with any words that you can understand. Right. So you want music tr that doesn't keep you on familiar ground, okay. which is another advantage of indigenous music, or, or, you know, vocal or non-vocal types, because it throws you into foreign territory. And the, the foreign territory is what you really want to be exploring right now, not staying on the familiar ground. Absolutely, yeah. So um, before we get into the sort of farther reaches of some of the experiences you yeah. had and the implications of that, um, I just listened or watched parts of that video that I had mentioned earlier, um, and you referenced William James, the great uh, early 20th century uh, psychologist, mm -hmm. um, who said something like that there are three stages of this kind of work that you've been doing, and one is, uh, the first one is kind of, you know, pushing the boundaries, going out into exploratory territory, but then following that up with meticulous recording, and then a third stage of analysis and sharing. Is that more or less accurate? Yeah, that's my, that's not so much William James, oh, but it's my articulation of the principles of psychedelic philosophy mm -hmm. based on the pioneering work that James did in that he used nitrous oxide and drew very striking conclusions in the context of the varieties of religious experience book. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically I just articulated this method from that, that mm -hmm. you go into temporary non-ordinary states, you record those states afterwards as clearly and precisely as you can. And that's important because that's really important, I think, to complete the circle of learning. Because if you want to do this in a systematic fashion, uh, 
integrating and attending to and trying to understand your experiences lays the foundation, a strong foundation for your next set of experiences. Mm -hmm. Just like our dreams are very revelatory. But if you keep a dream journal, people find that their dreams often become more powerful, more articulate. It is as if your mind knows that you're paying attention. The unconscious knows you're paying attention to it, mm -hmm. and therefore it, it ups its game. Likewise, in a session, the more attention you pay to integration and consolidating your experiences, it is as if the cosmic mind knows you're paying attention, and therefore it engages you more systematically at the end. So retaining the experiences is really important. And particularly if you're pushing the far boundaries like I was doing and entering into territory that was radically new to me and, and uncertain and, and I didn't have many cues even in, in the psychedelic literature for trying to understand much of it, writing at the very edges of my, uh, of my ability and trying to consolidate what I experienced was an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. And if I can loop back to your earlier question, why I wouldn't do it the same way again, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it the same way because of some of the things I learned on the journey. Mm. Uh, first of all, I found that over the long haul, working at doses this high, even doing it very responsibly and conscientiously, and supplementing it with a lot of other spiritual practice, a lot of attention to my body, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation. Um, it's a very, very demanding protocol. Uh, it, it, it exerts, uh, a, it's, it's a very taxing protocol. If I were doing it over again, I would be gentler with myself. I would balance high dose sessions with low dose sessions. I would balance LSD, which tends to be a high level, cosmic level psychedelic with psilocybin, ayahuasca, other psychedelics, which are more body grounded in order to facilitate an ongoing uh, integration of the peak experiences. Doing it the way I did, just hammering the high levels, just pushing and pushing, it did open great cosmic vistas. But I think, it, I, think I was harder on myself than I really needed to be, and maybe then was wise. Uh, and it took me a long time to internalize and in some ways to recuperate from that entire journey. Mm -hmm. The other reason I would do it a little differently is because I learned along the way that this is not a journey that comes ever comes to a distinct end. When I began this work, I thought there was an end point. I was trying to get to the end point. Some people describe the end point as oneness with God or entering into the primal void. Mm -hmm. And I had entered into oneness with the divine many times, and I had learned that there are many levels to that experience, and even levels to immersion in the primal void. And deep, about two-thirds of the way through the journey, I had an experience where the universe showed me that it's an absolute infinite universe. I would never be able to get to the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's an open-ended journey. You take in as much of the universe as you can, as is healthy and as wise for you. But the idea of getting to the end was just, it, it was a misconception. And because of that, uh, that's another reason why I would just be a little gentler and a little patient with the pace of a, a slower pace of evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> The, um, uh, my old Buddhist teacher, Chukyam Trungpa, has one of his books is called Journey Without Goal. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's yeah. the, um, are you familiar yeah. with the 10 ox herding pictures? Yes. Yeah, the, the way I've encountered them was, that, um, like the last one is something like, and thus ends the journey that never need to have been made in the first place, or something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now it's a little different, you know, I started this work kind of with the focus on enlightenment and that really is what the 10 ox herding pictures are about that journey of awakening to the ever-present condition mm -hmm. so that in the end you come back to where you were but you come back with your filters clear and the the present the always present ever-present condition mm -hmm. is luminously there yeah. that's where i that's the agenda i started with but it was overcome over it was superseded by two other aspects first it was superseded by the challenges of our collective enlightenment of our collective evolution 
eventually my personal healing or my personal enlightenment was just completely superseded by uh, responding to the call to support our collective transformation, uh, the transformation taking place in history. And the second thing um, that superseded then even that was the opportunity to explore the deep structure of the universe itself to what I'd call a cosmological exploration. You do not need to explore the deep structure of the universe in order to become awakened, to become to your spiritual senses. You do not need to go back to the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang to transcend all limits of time, to enter archetypal reality, to abide in the, the true and natural condition that Buddhism calls uh, you know, the, our essential nature. These are different projects. So my work kind of combined the Enlightenment project, but really it kind of yielded to a different project, what you might call the, the philosopher's project, the invitation to explore, as far as I could, the nature of a cosmic reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for clarifying that. So um, I don't know how to ask this question exactly, or even if it mm -hmm. is a good question, mm -hmm. but, uh, but something like this, you know, the, that kind of deep work is clearly not, uh, you know, prescribed for uh, a great majority of people. It's for mm -hmm. particular individuals who feel yeah. that they, they're that calling and, you know, feel that they're up for it. And you, you've you indicated in your talks that uh, you felt that calling, you know, earlier at the beginning of your career, you know, that you'd always been interested in that state and you felt like, or those kind that, you know, un, uh, you know, effing the ineffable, as Alan Watts put it, you know, <laughs> unscrewing yeah. the inscrutable. Um, uh, so um, I guess where I'm trying to go with this question is um, people that are, hmm, uh, a lot of people are not ever going to use psychedelics, but then there's another whole subset of people in the, in the, in the, the communities that, or the, you know, in the populace that uh, are working with these. And I'm I guess, uh, I don't know if they're, you know, like I say, what you could say about this, but, you know, the people that are not in that small group of people that are going to do that extremely deep work, um, do you have any, have you had any kind of thoughts, intuitions, feelings about, you know, how a lot of people can approach the work that needs to be done with the help of psychedelics? Hmm. Hmm. <sighs> Well, first, you're right that um, I, I wrote LSD in the Mind of the Universe with the hope that it would be read not only by other psychedelic voyagers. I hope psychedelic voyagers would, would read it and there would be a kind of conversation that would emerge from voyager to voyager back and forth. But I hope that this book would also be read by people who uh, are not interested in taking psychedelics and, and or who haven't had the opportunity because what's important I think in so many ways in the book is the cosmology that emerges is the visions of reality that emerge in the psychedelic state and these can be very valuable to people whether or not they ever touch these experiences themselves just to see what the understanding of reality that comes forward. Mm. Uh, and I've had many people write me since the book has come out and say, I've never taken psychedelics in my life, but I've been a lifelong meditator and I really relate to what you're saying. I've had many, many similar experiences of collective suffering, for example, or different death and rebirth experiences, mm -hmm. but I've never used psychedelics. And that's of course what we expect because psychedelics are simply an amplifier of consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's consciousness that does the work. So if you work with consciousness in a focused way, then naturally you're going to have similar experiences in different ways to what emerges in a psychedelic session. Now for people who want to work with psychedelics, several basic rules of thumb stand out for me. One of them is, uh, very, very meticulous attention to set and setting, uh, and, which of course I think is widely understood now, but I would emphasize uh, clarity of intention in creating the conditions of long-term engagement. Sometimes our engagement is short by a few months. Sometimes our undertaking is several years of work, but the longer 
our focused engagement, the more important it is to really set up the shop carefully, to really have your Kiva prepared both inwardly and outwardly so that your contact, what you want is clean contact and good recall. And clean contact means not obscuring the field with a lot of other things going on or tending to a lot of outside things. Tripping is fine. If people want to trip and a lot of people have life-changing experiences, tripping, no criticism there. But if you want to use this for deep inner work, you have to clarify your field, clear it out. And then the second thing that stands out is the importance of retention, the importance of holding on to your experiences, clarifying, re recording them, either with works of art. Sometimes people do it with music. For me, it's always been the written word. Methodologically, this, a lot of the work which is being done, important work being done with psychedelics, is therapeutically focused, aimed at healing the wounds of the personal psyche. And that's really important work. And we're learning a lot about that, particularly now in this renaissance of psychedelics. <clears throat> but that which heals at the therapeutic level, at the personal unconscious level, is also that which opens work experiences deeper into the cosmos itself. It's in renewing our relationship with the universe that heals so much of our wounds of incarnation. Wow. And if you are called or feel called to push the boundaries, I mean, it really is, there are some people who love to climb mountains and some people who love to, you know, go deep into the oceans. They just have an adventurous spirit. And I think that also is true for those who want to explore states of consciousness but it takes a certain personality type, if you will, to you have to, a certain rigor, a certain uh, capacity to maintain ambiguity, uh, uh, to deal with ambiguity, uh, a certain kind of mm, stability of your social circumstance, because it, it's not just you who go into these states, but in, to a degree, everyone that you are intimately associated with is touched by your work. So you have to make sure your life is grounded and solid that supports the work. And the last thing I would mention is the deeper you want to go into these non-ordinary states, the more important it is to have a daily spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. I just have become so convinced of this over the time because you need a daily spiritual practice to ground first just the energy that's unleashed in these states and then to ground the experiences. Mm -hmm. The more you learn about mysticism, and the more you study the autobiographies of our great saints and sages, the, the easier it is, I think, to have, it gives you a touchstone for grounding your more radical experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, uh, you mentioned the great saints and all that, and uh, uh, I don't think there's an answer to this, but it, it's just been on my mind a little bit later lately that, you know, there are these, um, you know, kind of uh, pinpoint, people over the last couple of thousand years that we, you know we hear about I don't remember all the names but you know mm -hmm. St John of the Cross St Francis Meister Eckhart and a few of these great mystics that we know about you know of course you know there are probably many from indigenous traditions yeah. that weren't writing anything down yeah. um, but uh, uh, you know where are these people now I mean are there just too many of us for them to stand out on the planet now like where are mm -hmm. the people like Ram Ramana Maharshi and these people that seem to have completely gotten it so to speak yeah i don't know the answer to that question that's kind of a sociological and historical question i, mm -hmm. I don't really know the answer no. i think that we are that they're more hidden saints than we might appreciate mm -hmm. uh, but i also think in a fundamental way uh, i agree with those who have observed that the age of private enlightenment is coming to an end it's already mm -hmm. come to an end and it's not like individual you know, enlightenment work is not important. It is important. Mm -hmm. But we have entered into a time of history where we need to, to draw the whole human species needs to enter into the enlightened condition. The whole human species needs to, to really get at the roots of what's holding us in this tight configuration of ego. Mm -hmm. Because the world, the civilization that we are in now is a civilization built by the ego. And the ego is ultimately a, a, a cut off psychological entity. We, we don't experience our common ground 
with other beings and we don't experience our common ground with the universe itself. It's a fragmented condition and it builds a fragmented universe. And right now, the fragmentation of our universe is threatening the very vitality of the life of the, all life on our planet. So I think we are moving into a time where the real impetus is collective transformation. And that's a, that I think is kind of taking us into a different level of the game mm -hmm. than we were in for the last 2000 years. Yeah, well put, beautifully put. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, my old Buddhist teacher that I mentioned earlier, Chugyam Trungpa, um, I don't, you probably know more about this than I, than I do as a concept, but uh, um, uh, I think there are different uses of the word term arhat, but mm -hmm. the way Trumpa talked about it was he, uh, he was critical of what he called the arhat mentality, which was the enlightenment for self kind of mentality was the way he described yeah. it. Yeah, so, you know, I, I completely agree with you. So yeah. perhaps that leads in, for me anyway, into... Uh, this discussion of the sort of great death and great awakening that you talk about in your work and that you explored in those journeys. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the probably the primary uh, motivation for me doing this YouTube channel series altogether is because of the kind of things you were just talking about, that we've reached a, karm, a kind of a karmic comeuppance point where the, that fragmented ego mentality has brought the planet to a place where it's not sustainable to continue in this direction anymore. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm wondering if you could you know, talk a little bit about, I know one thing that you've you mentioned in your talks is that uh, uh, you, you, you weren't given a timeline on this. There was no 2012 involved. Um, but it sounds to me like, uh, I don't know, an image I've been using occasionally is um, a boat coming down a river toward a whirlpool. Um, or you might use the term vortex. And, uh, you know, at first, when the, when, the, when the boat first gets pulled into the, into the orbit, as it were, of the, of the vortex, it's going around the outer edge kind of slowly, but then it's gradually getting pulled. The strength becomes the, of the pull becomes increasingly strong and rapid. And it seems to me we're, we're well into that vortex now. I don't know. Do you, can you comment on yeah. that? Yeah. Well... <clears throat> This was a great surprise for me in my work, because when I began this work, I was thinking that this, I was thinking in terms of a model of individual transformation. I was doing this work to transform and improve my, my private self in some way. And, and that was shattered. After two years, the game changed. It was, it was not about that. And about four years into the work, I began to be given a series of visions that continued to unfold over over 50 sessions. Uh, and the, the theme of these visions was always humanity's collective transformation. They were consistent in, in over, over time. And the message was humanity was coming to a point of a before and after point in history of a decisive transformation of an evolutionary jump in the, um, the, the quality of, of consciousness that we would be living out of and through. Just, just an, an exponential, a time of great blessing, a time of great grace, a, a, of great illumination, of great healing. And these visions came for years, but I was never shown in these early years how nature was going to pull this off. Because when I looked around me, it didn't look like that was what was happening. It, it looked like we, for every indicator that we were getting better, there were other indicators that we were getting worse, of more insanity, more greed, more corporate control. And, mm -hmm. and then in 1995, I was given a very, very deep um, session, a series of visions, and I was taken into the future. Time became very pourable permeable in my sessions. I, I entered into multiple modalities of trans-temporal experiences. And in this, I entered into the deep future and I experienced what I came to understand was the death and rebirth of our entire species in some collective historical crescendo. And I experienced it not as crispish individual self looking on and not even as a spiritual aspect of Chris Bache looking on. By this time, I had dissolved so many times and so deeply into the collective mind that I experienced 
this crisis as a as the species. I experience it literally as a rippling of crisis arising within the collective psyche. And I experience a time of tremendous uh, suffering, a time of things falling apart, of loss of control, of, of, of human beings losing more and more of the constants of their world. It, the image that comes to mind is of a, a hurricane that's coming over a small island, which is just threatening all life on the island. And for a time, in my experience, I thought we were going to go extinct. I thought we were heading into an extinction event. But then at the peak time, the storm passed and humanity began to recover, to pick themselves up. And when we began to pick ourselves up, something extraordinary happened. In the process of going through this crisis, we were changed. I think it's our heart was broken open in a way there was some kind of deep transformation when the pain became so terrible, we, we began to make choices that we weren't willing to consider making at an earlier time of stability. In such extreme instability, we began to make different choices. And when we were past the worst of this crisis, there was a tremendous kind of uh, ups upsurging of new values, new insights, uh, new uh, ways of being, uh, new ways of organizing. And if there were one fundamental theme that emerges, it is uh, the theme of oneness. We had an experience deep in our psyche of oneness that permeates all existence. And th that's a tremendous spiritual revitalization. And then subsequently in other sessions, I was taken deep into deep time and given an experience of what I came to call the future human. That, that is, this is a change which is not going to simply precipitate a political restructuring or an economic restructuring or a social restructuring. It's a change which is going to reach so deeply into the collective psyche that it actually causes an evolutionary flip of the archetype of the blueprint or the archetypal blueprint of the human psyche so that there is literally a, an, a re, an emerging an emergence of a restructured core around which our individual lives crystallize. In time, I came, and just to touch this future human, to, to go into deep time and just to touch it was such a clarifying experience. It was so gratifying because this magnificent uh, uh, humanity with its heart healed of all the pain that we've caused each other through time and that has been caused in us by nature. A, a tremendous illumination of the human mind. Uh, it was truly an enlightened species that was emerging uh, out of this process. And this has been, this I think gave the larger context for my entire life and my understanding of history that we are in right now. It, it gave a context which helped me understand why my individual enlightenment fell away as insignificant and that my sessions went for years aiming at collective transformation and to trying to support this collective transformation wherever possible. It did not give me any timeline, as you said. It did not give me any specifics. It did not tell me when, where, or how. But the certainty and the magnitude of this convulsion seem to be driven by some kind of global ecological crisis that triggered a global systemic crisis, a crisis of global systems, which then I began, after I began to have these experiences, I began to do my ecological homework. I began to read more widely in the ecological literature to pay attention to the people who've been tracking these things. And I think it's clear, you know, and I give the references in the book that we are coming to a critical time in human evolution. We are on the verge of losing the planet if we don't change our ways. Mm -hmm. And we don't seem to be changing our ways nearly fast enough to avoid a, a crisis of unprecedented proportions. Mm -hmm. So I had these experiences 
1985 uh, to 1999, you know, 20 years ago. And um, it seems that these are unfolding now, that we are entering increasingly uh, a time of ecological plague, in a way, a time of great, great um, ecological uncertainty coming at us, devastation coming at us in global climate change. In this context, I, I watch COVID-19, and I don't see it as the true crisis of this era. It seems to be too small a crisis, but it's a serious crisis. And it's a crisis that if we respond to it well, it could teach us many things that we will need when the deeper crises emerge, which are coming in the decades ahead. Mm -hmm. it, and I think, it, I think it is teaching us. I mean, it, there are those who are learning from it, mm -hmm. and then those who are just trying to quickly get back to normal uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. But I think, I think normal we're going to find is farther and farther uh, irretrievable. We now have no choice but to go into a new future and to find our way into this new future. And I think the divine, or whatever you want to call the, the intelligence of the universe, the creative capacity of the universe, is pulling us that way. It supports us as we cooperate with this crisis. It's taking us somewhere that it wants us to go. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've, the, I've, I've kind of had the same intuition about the, the COVID situation. Uh, I, in, it, it's kind of a fantasy, I suppose you could say in my mind that, that you know, the, the, the gods, as it were, whatever that is, as you say, the divine, um, mm -hmm. uh, there, I don't know how this functions, of course, um, and how hands on they would be with our journey. But it, I could almost imagine that the, that the COVID situation is kind of like um, letting us down step by step, like, Here's what can happen when there's a great disruption, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you say, you know what what kinds of changes uh, in our individual mentalities and the way that we do things collectively <laughs> might come out of this. And you know, of course, that remains to be seen. But you know, I, yeah. I, I have a feeling that at the very least, you know, the whole world has been quieter and cleaner for a while. And, you know, even if people, I mean, I could be completely wrong about this, but I, I wonder if, you know, that even if people don't really consciously kind of pay attention to, you know, the implications of that, it's it's gotten in under their skin on some level, you know. Um, birds are more audible. There may be more of them around, you know. Uh, the air mm -hmm. is cleaner. Uh, um, the pace of life has been slower. I'm seeing so many people riding bicycles around my neighborhood, you know. I'm hoping that more of them will, you know, many of them will continue mm -hmm. to ride those bicycles. And people are jogging like nothing, like nobody's business around my neighborhood <laughs> lately, you know. Yeah. Um, they're going to come, you know, when people get back to their quote-unquote normal life, uh, I, I, I think a lot of people are going to uh, find that they've come back rested, um, healthier, They've probably been eating more at home, cooking more at home. Like it's hard to find mm -hmm. yeast in the stores around Vancouver, <laughs> baking yeast, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, the way you describe this great death, uh, you know, trajectory sounds pretty frightening, uh, in a sense, you know. And I guess um, it, it, to what I, what comes out to my mind comes into my mind about that is that it's increasingly becoming more and more important for anyone who possibly can to um, be a, a rock, as it were, uh, for others, you know? Yeah, it is frightening. Uh, it really is frightening. And I think it's therefore important to really understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of people who will be calling on the apocalyptic end of days and um, all sorts of interpretations. There'll be uh, people be talking about extinction and, and um, so on and so forth. But I think what's really happening is that we are in labor. We're, this is a birth. Mm -hmm. Gestation is a long process. It's a nine-month process, but labor takes place with 24 hours. It's a very short, very intense process in which we give birth to something new. Mm -hmm. I think humanity has been gestating the future human 
for thousands and thousands of years. Mm. But the process of giving birth to it is really convulsive. And if you walked into a room when there was a woman giving labor right in the middle of it, and she's yelling and screaming and everyone's running around, you would think, oh, this is terrible. She's going to die. Mm. But if you know what's happening, you know that this is labor. This is what labor is like. Mm. Well, we are going into a collective labor, I believe. And, and therefore, it's important for us to to cultivate an appreciation of what this actually consists of. We are giving birth to a new form of human being, not simply uh, better in a few little ways, dressing up the edges, but a deep reconstruction of the human psyche. And the way I've come to understand this is in terms of the concept of the diamond soul, which is a, a different image, but basically it refers to other sessions that I went through where I experienced what seemed to be, I was given a series of teachings, experiential teachings about where reincarnation is taking us, you know, and it led me to have an understanding of reincarnation, which went considerably beyond the way it's been talked about in the traditional Eastern sources. Because I think basically the idea in traditional thinking of reincarnation, we reincarnate, we reincarnate, we reincarnate, karma follows us, we make improvements, we get a little bit better and better, we go from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade, hopefully more compassion, more intelligent, more resourceful, incremental, incremental change. But I think what happens eventually in, in the reincarnation process, we die and we go into spirit where we reconnect with soul, the consciousness that holds all of our experience. We're born, we get small, we learn, we die, we get large, we born, we get small, mm -hmm. and we keep this up for thousands and thousands of years. Beautiful. Only touching our soul, our total consciousness, mm -hmm. usually in the afterlife state, in the bardo state. Mm -hmm. But if this keeps up, all of us has been going through this for thousands, thousands of years, mm -hmm. sooner or later, there comes a point where I think all what happened in my sessions, all my former lives started coming in and they hit critical mass. They, and when they hit critical mass, there was a massive explosion of energy and they fused. And when they fused, an extraordinary diamond light broke out of my chest mm -hmm. and it catapulted me into a state of consciousness beyond anything I had been in up to that point. And it was a state of consciousness in which I was an individual, but I was an individual beyond any frame of reference that I had known it previously. Mm -hmm. And I think what, that's what's happening with reincarnation, that there comes a time in history when all of our former lives become integrated. Mm -hmm. In the early stages, when we integrate our former lives, we often have to deal with leftover pain and problems that have been that are still reside in these former lives. So the emphasis is on healing and and clarifying. But eventually, when they are, when all of that work is done and they they fuse into a new singularity, and that singularity I think is the birth of the soul in time, so that we permanently shift our identity from the ego of this small short term body, which lives maybe a hundred years, to the soul, which lives and thinks and feels on a, a much, much larger time horizon. Mm -hmm. I think this birth of soul consciousness inside time is taking place simultaneously, well, as the planet is trying to come to terms with its divisive history and is trying to deal with it, problems which it cannot solve at the national level, but can only solve at the global level, mm. as we're trying to come together as one planet. Yeah. Internally, the players there are trying to come together as one soul, so that there is a reciprocity between the, the outer political, ecological dynamic and the inner psycho-spiritual dynamic, so that I think the ego is the psychological structure that built this world, and the ego will never be able to solve the problems that we have generated. It takes the expansion of the soul to really have the depth of courage and the depth of compassion and the depth of insight mm -hmm. to really carry us into the creation of the next stage of our planetary evolution. Yeah, beautifully put again. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah. My my sense of of this passage, I guess you could say, is that uh, it 
you know, it, it is scary, as we were saying, that it looks like a lot of things that, you know, people have been able to, you know, hold as, as, as status quo and stability are going to be ripped away from us and so on and so mm -hmm. on. It's going to be a really challenging time. Um, I guess the hopeful or more optimistic part of my, my mind um, uh, uh, adheres to this old saying, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. And it feels like as we move out of, it's like we've been, you know, as you know, living in, you know, in, in, in an illusion in a sense, you know, in a, in, a, in a kind of a collective and individual dream that's virtual, that's based in our thoughts and our, you know, in, it's in our heads and all that. And, um, uh, you know, as Ter Terrence McKenna has, and others have put it, whistling past the graveyard, you know, mm -hmm. trying to ignore, the, you know, the reality of, of ego death yeah. and, the, and the spirit that, you know, encompasses all. Um, but as we, as these conditions destabilize, uh, I think perhaps one of the amazing thing that's, things that's going to come out of this is you know because there is such a deep well of creativity and capability in the human species i think we're going to see a lot of that coming forth you know that uh, um, oh that's another one of my favorite sayings uh, from victor hugo something to the effect of there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come right yeah. so i think yeah. we're going to see um you know uh, as as the old ways become less viable, people can put less faith in them, uh, a greater openness to new ideas. Yes, I think we're experiencing this profound polarization taking place now. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be forces pulling us very strongly toward the past, mm -hmm. towards the divisions of the past, towards the certainties of the past, towards the patterns of the past. And then there will be forces taking us into the future, taking us into something less certain, more unexplored. Uh, but, but I think the, uh, the juice is going to be with the future because with the past, if we, if we keep allow ourselves to be pulled into the past and the patterns of consumption and corporate control and so on, violence and, um, you know, placing one race over another, or one religion over another, one continent over another, that way ends in death. Mm -hmm. It just ends in death. Yeah. But a different a future, a, a collaborative future, working for a world that works for all, working, working where a certain portion of the population has less so that everybody has more, is going to produce a much, much happier, better existence for all of us in, in the end. And I, I think we have the courage to make it. I think, you know, things like the coronavirus are basically giving us an opportunity to flex our courage, to flex our wisdom, and to say no when we're being told lies by people who represent the past, mm -hmm. uh, people who represent, you know, the, the faded wisdom of patriarchy, uh, the faded, uh, the, you know, the unspeakable shame of, of uh, ego. And we see it dramatized on the body politic today, you know, and, and that just leaves a sour taste in our mouth where when we see courage, when we see compassion, when we see wisdom, insight, working for our collective good, that we recognize and say, yes, I want to be like that. I want to support those forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, yeah. hopefully that, you know, as Leonard Cohen put it, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in, that the light yeah. will be coming in. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, 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 I, I, was, I, I read some of the channeled books that were popular back in the late 80s and early 90s. And one guy that I kind of mm -hmm. liked uh, more than others was a guy named Ken Carey. He had a book, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of books called Starseed, uh, The mm -hmm. Third Millennium and things like that. And one of the things that assuming this was actually channeled that his you know chan his source his entity was saying was um uh these technologies that you have you know these communication technologies they're actually pretty interesting because you know when when the information gets to the point where you can you know be sending out that you know the idea whose time has come we now have this capability of um, sharing information instantly around the planet, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a, we have these stepping stones in a sense now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, and and I think what I'm saying and what I'm describing, if if it were just me having these experiences, and then it would be maybe not that significant. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have been having these experiences and sharing these ideas. They've been seeing the same thing. A lot of psychedelic voyagers have been seeing this basic vision of a time of fundamental historical crisis and choice. Uh, indigenous cultures have been seeing this vision emerging for decades in their work. Uh, mm -hmm. Mystics like uh, and, and um, contemplatives, meditators who would never go near psychedelics have been having this mm -hmm. deepening insight that this is a time of crisis. This is a time of where we must grow up. And I think that's one way of looking at it. This is is a time of maturation. We have to grow up and to take responsibilities as adults. And there's a certain way in which we've been living like adolescents oh with the qualities of adolescence. But now we need to grow up. And I think we have that capacity. And I really think we will. I, I think we're going to make this transition, even though it's going to get difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I just have confidence mm -hmm. in, I, I think when I'm really feeling deeply uncertain and fearful, I remind myself that the universe has brought us this far. And I know that there are end roads, there are extinction events that are taking place all around us. But I trust that if, if we are entering into a time of such momentous choice and consequences, that we, the universe must think that we're ready. Mm. And I think I will, so I place my trust in the universe's wisdom. And at least in my sessions, the universe seems to clearly think that we're ready and that it knows what it's doing and we will be able to participate in that knowing. Well, this is the reason why I'm so happy that you are my um, initial or inaugurative um, guest on this hopefully um, developing series because that, uh, you know, this one, it's 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 central to to why I have such respect for you and your work, Chris. Is that that it's hopeful. It it points out that there you know who we possibly can be, and that there was a there is a way to get there, right? You know, so there is a little bit like the four noble truths. You know that the, yeah. that that there is a way to get there. You know, there are pathways and. And, mm -hmm. you know, and as we've been talking about here, you know, people need that kind of, you know, encouragement, that kind of, you know, vision to be shared, uh, you know, as, as things get, you know, less stable for people, that they have less to, you know, less ground to hang on to. So um, uh, um, mm -hmm. I think this is probably a good time to uh, bring it to a close. We've been talking for close to an hour. And uh, I'm, I'm, it's clear that uh, you could have a lot more to say <laughs> on these topics. So we might have to do it again, actually. Um, okay. It just occurred to me at this very moment. Because um, <laughs> uh, you, uh, you're, you're, I'll have to say, uh, you're an easy interview, uh, Chris, uh, <laughs> because uh, I just need to ask one question. And you have so much to say, and you articulate it so, so clearly and so beautifully. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. I'm really moved in my heart to you know to hear these kinds of things that you have experienced and that you're sharing with people so um uh this being my very first one i don't haven't figured out how to end these yet i know sometimes mm. people would uh you know say goodbye to the guest and then talk to the talk to the um the, the viewers yeah. a little bit but i think i'll just do that while you're still here if you don't mind um so i'll say well, before you do that and then that's fine to do but first i want to thank you Okay. for your initiative because you've been drawing people together in the conferences that you've been organizing for years now and in your commitment to our collective transformation has been profound and this continues in this series your 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 vision is for collective awakening and i just honor that and just mm -hmm. want to thank you for it oh thanks so much for saying that and yeah that is the reason you know um i, I just feel really connected to that vision and you know, I, another one of my favorite sayings is from uh, Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu, the legendary uh, South African bishop. Yeah. Um, and I don't don't remember the full sentence, but it was something to the effect that a, a lot of people don't believe in the possibility of possibility, and that that's what we need is you have to believe in the possibility of possibility. Yeah. And it, to my mind. E you know the the ego and whatever it is can cook up all kinds of stories about what's going on but there's only one attitude that's functional 
and that is to believe in the possibility of possibility and do what you need to do, your own healing work and participating, whatever you can do. Right? Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah. So um, it's a wonderful vision. It's a wonderful prayer. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, do you want to say anything? Um, is there, can people contact you or is there anything to say about that? Well, actually, I've, I'm embarrassed that I haven't <clears throat> gotten my website finished mm -hmm. yet. I Hopefully, it will be up in a month or so. Uh, it will be chrisbeige.com will be where people will be able to find me online. Yeah. Right now, they can find me if they go to my articles and uh, publications. If they go to academia.edu and... Uh, sign in there. They'll be able to find me under Chris M. Beish and everything that I've written and many of the uh, podcasts are there. But chrisbeish.com soon will be where people can reach me. And they can also reach me at my university website, my address, uh, cmbeish at ysu.edu. I should be able to put little tabs up on the screen at some point yeah. to show those for people. And in the meantime, uh, just so they know, well, I think maybe it's showing on the screen. It, it does on mine when I'm speaking and when you're speaking, but it's pronounced, mm. or I mean, spelled B-A-C-H-E. Yes. Not a, it's not necessarily an intuitive um, spelling and pronunciation match. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the book uh, that we're talking about, more than any, uh, you know, he's got other works, as I mentioned at the beginning, is this one. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's really remarkable. And there's so much more in this book that we didn't cover today. So I hope people will go and find this book. Uh, it's going to be, it already is, and will continue to be part of this kind of um, transformation that we're talking about. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, really. Thank you very much. Thank Chris. you for the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity to bring these ideas forward to your listeners. Mm -hmm. And you do it so well, Chris, really. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I know you're humble about it, but, um, you know, I could listen to you all day. You really mm -hmm. have the, you know, you're in, you're doing the right job. You know, you've found, you found <laughs> your job, I think, because you explain it so, so clearly. Uh, so again, Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank um, you. And I'll just say, uh, while you're still here, because I haven't, like I say, I haven't figured out quite, you know, how I want to end these things. I'll just say that uh, um, uh, I'm hoping to be able to put a little subscribe button up on here, and I hope people will mm -hmm. subscribe to this YouTube channel and uh, share it and so on. And it'll also be on Anchor, which is an audio podcast. Uh, I hope, well, once I figure it out, we'll strip the audio off, off the video and put it on Anchor as well. So, again, much, much thanks from the heart, Chris. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye, <laughs> okay. my friend.